Yeah, the, the talk is uh, only very briefly about um, uh, machine learning and we hope to also speak about machine psychology. Uh, and the title of the talk is also Artificial General Intelligence from the Perspective of Non-Axiomatic Logic. So, so we, we're here to the digital futures uh, and digital futures, as many people know, is about solving problems with the, within these domains using technologies that we develop collaboratively between KTH and uh, Stockholm University and, and the RISE. And there can be very hard problems to solve, actually. Uh, for example, how can in a smart society, autonomous systems communicate with each other and learn from each other or from human beings? Uh, how, how do we need to adapt educations to be uh, effective? How can we create something like empathic artificial agents? How can we understand depression uh, and can we model it in a machine and resolve the depression in the machine with human dialogue? I think that's problems typical uh, for something you could attack with the technologies within uh, digital futures. But the question we want to ask today is what type of technology can we expect that we need to solve these problems? That's the question that we put in the back of our head. And Patrick and I will speak from the perspective of AGI, which artificial general intelligence, which typically can be said to be the field that aims to build general, general purpose intelligence systems, systems that could solve many different problems across many domains, typically taking a very holistic approach uh, and sometimes associated with these things like human level AI or strong AI, but very importantly, distinguished from AI where highly efficient solutions uh, are found to very domain specific problems like image recognition. So we will introduce AGI from the perspective of non-axiomatic logic, NARS, uh, non-axiomatic reasoning system. And I will pro provide, Patrick will speak about that, and I will provide a perspective from behavioral psychology, including research methods and how we view scientific progress. And we will argue for a research path that can integrate AGI and behavioral psychology that we hope could benefit both fields. So over to you, Patrick. Okay. I'm glad to, to be allowed to talk uh, in, this, uh, in this meeting. <laughs> and uh, what I will introduce to you is a, is a, a reasoning system called OpenNAS for applications. And I think it's, it can be one of the relevant future technologies. Um, and uh, this is uh, to, to first show you my main goals, which is uh, to show the, the benefits of a general purpose reasoning system that can learn and to contrast it with special purpose solutions, which are, which are ver very well suited for specific tasks, which nature solved, uh, nature uh, had similar differences between selecting for specificity and uh, generality, and uh, which is shown in this picture uh, here, illustrated. Um, and uh, for me, uh, the main objective was uh, or is uh, to create an effective NAS implementation to design uh, uh, um, NAS implementation design to enhance the autonomy of intelligent agents, because this is where I think the general purpose agents can make a difference over agents which can only do one task well. But first, what is this non axiomatic reasoning system? It's a general purpose reasoning system proposed by my advisor, actually, by Dr. Bai Wang, which follows the idea that intelligence is the ability for a system to adapt to its environment while working with insufficient knowledge and resources. And such a system should work in real time, accept uh, new information 
at every moment. Uh, so new information can constantly stream into the system and it should work with finite processing demands and storage space, which means even if you feed it additional information, it should not get slower. Um, and the way it's realized is there is a control mechanism, which is uh, attention driven, which means it's, uh, it's doing selective processing of the information and uh, a memory structure, which exploits composition compositionality of buttons. And uh, the logic of this reasoning system is actually a term logic and not, uh, not predicate logic. Um, and it con contains uh, multiple uh, forms of statements like uh, uh, inheritance statements like cat is an animal, is the first one or sequences and implications like A and B happened in a sequence or temporal relationships like lightning leads to thunder, sets like Sam and Garfield are cats and cats are meowing for it and, and for it. And uh, also relationships can be expressed like that animal eats food. Um, what distinguishes this uh, logic from predicate logic is that there is no binary proof so it's not, so statement is not either false or true, but instead uh, there's a positive and negative evidence measure associated with each statement. Based on this, you can define the frequency value, which is uh, the positive evidence over the total evidence and the confidence uh, measure, which is uh, the total evidence map to a value between zero and one. And why do we need those two measures? It essentially allows the system to keep track of the size of the sample space that has seen so far. So for instance, uh, if you ask yourself, is a, coin, is a coin fair? And you do 10 coin flips and you get five hats. This should give less confidence than 100 coin flips and 50 hats. While in both cases, the frequency value is 0 0.5, but the amount of samples collected is different. This is why it's a two valued the truth value associated to each statement, the frequency and the confidence or equally the positive and the negative evidence. Um, and with this, you can do interesting things. For instance, you can build a system which is able to learn temporal relationships. So for instance, if you have an event sequence ABC, then you can make this event sequence uh, attribute positive evidence to the relationship A leads to B positive evidence that A and B together leads to C and positive evidence that A leads to C. But if A does happen, but B does not happen, this is when negative evidence is collected for this implication statement. And so in this case, we can see, we can say that the frequency is actually the success of the temporal implication to predict the outcome, while the confidence encodes the amount of samples which the system has seen about this relationship. So, and a large part of my PhD thesis is about the design and implementation of such a system. Um, and uh, what I tried to do is to combine only stable aspects of the NAS theory and to make the system focused on agency, that is to have systems that make decisions to reach desired outcomes or goals. Um, so the system I've developed is, is a special case of a non-axiomatic reasoning system. And so the capabilities of this uh, system is to learn from event streams in real time without interruption um, and to extract sensory motor contingencies. What is this? The idea is that certain events can correspond to motor action, to actuators. And essentially what you want the system then to do is to learn which actions lead to which outcomes under which circumstances. Or, or given specific circumstances, what will be the consequence of, of the action? What other events will happen if a certain, certain actuator 
is 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 used, and this the system can then use to plan ahead to reach goals, and this can enhance the autonomy of intelligent agents, including robotic solutions, because this allows the system to learn new procedure knowledge at runtime. The architecture uh, uh, proposed uh, looks like this, and we will go briefly step by step through it. So it uh, receives events from different modalities, which is point one, can be camera, can be microphone, can be a touch sensor, and it, uh, and it combines those events into temporal sequences. And from there, it goes into the attention buffer where all this information from the different sensors competes for attention. And, and, and from there, essentially, it's a reasoning loop which happens. There's a memory structure, which we call concept memory. And the idea is always to take an element out of this attention buffer, favoring the highest priority one, and then select the second premise, which is already in memory, and then to send both premises to those inference blocks to derive new events, which will then go into the attention buffer again. And um, there are two types of inference here. This is where there are two inference blocks, which is semantic inference, which always depends on a common premise, like you have S is a M, and M is a P, so you can, include, can conclude that S is a P. You see there's a common term M here. Also, if cat is an animal and animal is a being, we can, can conclude cat is a being. So here it's the animal, which is the shared term. So semantic inference block is about inference where both parameters share a common term. Well, well, there is other, there is sensory motor inference, which is about dealing with, with temporal relationships. Like if, uh, like if you have event A and event B, you want it to build this A implies B relationship so to, to give positive evidence to this relationship. And if you already have such a relationship, you can use it for prediction. Meaning if you get an event A and you already have the relationship that A leads to B, you can predict B. And as, as a special case of this sensory motor inference is sub -goaling. That is, the system wants to reach some goal. There are multiple candidate hypotheses how to get G, how to get the score G given current circumstances. And it should select an operation which most likely will, will lead to G to happen. But sometimes this cannot happen in a single step. So it needs to, to generate the, the context as a sub -core, and This is exactly what it does. So if it can do it in a single step, it will simply use the best operation, which most likely leads to G. If it cannot do it, it will derive the subcourt. Um, the usage of NAS is always you, you feed it events, uh, which can be beliefs, scores, and questions. Beliefs are essentially current state of affairs or current, current sensory measures. Um, goals are essentially the events the system wants to achieve, and questions are, uh, are uh, statements the system tries to answer. And the output of the system is always operations to execute and answers to questions. This, uh, so this is the input-output interface to the system. Um, but and he here I will now, now briefly show a, a, a use case scenario in the smart city domain, which is about anomaly detection. Um, so the idea here is uh, you need to find, uh, or you want the system to detect different traffic anomalies, can, it, can be speeding, can be jaywalking, can be, um, can be a dangerous, potentially dangerous situation. And what the system here does is there's a camera here and there's a deep neural network which is able to detect uh, to detect objects, and then there is an object tracker which is a, which uses those detections to track objects over multiple camera frames, and or, or in real time, 
And the system then automatically builds categories of, okay, this is a zone where there are mostly pedestrians, like it's a, it's a sidewalk. In this zone, there are, the, there are mostly cars, those are, so, so it's a street. And uh, it automatically also keeps track of the evidence for the direction entities are going. And it can use this to make predictions about the future location of entities and also to, to detect anomalies with some background knowledge about what, what jaywalking is, for instance, as we will see briefly. Um, so the idea here is uh, for the operator to define some background knowledge about, anom about anomalies of interest. And then the system builds spatial temporal relationships between entity detections and builds region categories. And it is supposed to be able to predict future locations of objects and uses knowledge to, to detect anomalies. Um, so there's a camera, then there's an object detector and tracker, which, which gives, gives the reason that inform, the, the information about the, the current scene, about what it currently is. And then there's some background knowledge about anomalies, which the reason uses to detect them. Um, we won't have time to go into the details of encoding here, but uh, to, to show an example, for instance, here you see, uh, you see uh, pink arrows, uh, arrows which indicate uh, the system predicting the future location of this car entity. And uh, and interestingly, the learning speed uh, is quite quick. If we if we show it such a scene, it on, it's only a matter of seconds for the system to to learn how how object moves, uh, how, how the, the cars move, and, and it can do this in, in a matter of seconds. So it's really quick in building those temporal relationships. Um, for the anomalies, this is more similar like uh, also with expert systems, because in this case, it's, it should simply detect what the user is, is interested in. So it's possible to give this reasoning system background knowledge. Which it, which it can then use, for instance, to, to, to make it detect jaywalking. Like here, if there's a pedestrian and the pedestrian is at the, at the street, the system should generate a jaywalking message. So this is the less interesting, but the more interesting one is that it learns those temporal relationships. It can, can use them for the detection of the anomalies then integrating it with the background knowledge. Uh, as, a, as examples, uh, the type of anomalies it can detect is like dangerous situations, like or potentially dangerous, like here, or uh, jaywalking where, uh, where a pedestrian is walking over a street. So th this is uh, something we did together with Cisco systems. And, uh, and, um, and the good thing about this approach is it's not really dependent on a specific camera. If you if you put it in a different scene, it will equally learn where is the street, where are the sidewalks, what is used as a bike lane, and so on. And it will automatically um, uh, adapt to the different situations and be able to identify those kinds of anomalies. Um, maybe I will. So, so this is a case of real time reasoning for anomaly detection, um, and which also shows this ability to, to learn those temporal relationships. But I wanted, uh, I always wanted to go more into robotics because I'm more interested in sensory motor interaction uh, rather than simply a passive observation of a, of a scene. So uh, what, I, what I then realized is that NAS is actually more like a belief, desire, intention model, but with the ability to learn, or to learn new procedural knowledge on the fly, which I think is very important for robotics. There are also some other uh, observations like that in autonomous robotics, usually you have multiple objectives to reach. So it's not a single, single state action mapping like in reinforcement learning that you can use. Um, also, also 
uh, learning speed is, is a very important metric here because of body integrity of the robot and time constraints. So large scale trial and error is not an option. And uh, um, yes, and the, the other part is maybe not that important for now, but uh, with, with this system, I really tried to build a reliable real-time learner, um, which can adjust or uh, which can learn procedure knowledge on the fly. And, uh, and um, I have experimented with some robotics cases uh, or, or use cases like that it should learn to, it should learn to avoid obstacles. Um, simply based on the core, do not have low ultrasonic readings and it, uh, and to keep moving essentially. And what we, we, what we see in this experiment is this ability to learn, this, to learn a behavior which fulfills both cores, not to stay in one place, but also to avoid low ultrasonic values, which the behavior with, which it automatically learns here is to avoid obstacles, or to move around obstacles, because this allows it to keep moving while avoiding low ultrasonic values. A more interesting example built on this, which is uh, which is uh, to to find a bottle and to to find a bottle which is in the room and to return it to the other bottle. And here it uh, uses the knowledge it has learned in the previous experiment. So it's, uh, it's like a curriculum learning where it uses the knowledge from the previous task in order to be able to complete this task. And in this task, there is also some additional background knowledge I give it, which is what it should essentially do. Namely, it should pick the bottle and it should uh, return it to the others. And this is manages to do. Um, let's see, maybe we can speed this a bit up. Oh, it's almost done. So it's a combination of, uh, of background knowledge and learned knowledge which is the key here. Um, as we see it, it simply tries to return this. Mechanically, this was not very well executed yet because there, was some, there were some mechanical issues with the, with the grabber. I have a newer version, but, but I cannot show currently. Um, but the, the really good thing about this is that most of the behavior which you have just seen is actually learned. Like to move forward if nothing is seen, to move left when an obstacle is in front, to avoid it. Um, also other, other things it learns from objects, like if there's an object on the left and it moves left, then it will be centered. If it's, if it's on the right side and it will move to the right, it will also be in the center. And it automatically is able to learn this knowledge which it has learned from other objects. It's automatically able to, to apply it to the bottle, even though it has not done a bottle before, but because it has abstracted that, abstracted or learned this abstract knowledge that is, okay, when something is on the left and I turn to the left, then I can see it in the middle. And, and the mission specific background knowledge is very minimal. It's only that it should pick the bottle if it's in front and to drop it uh, and to drop it to the other bottles if it sees the other groups, group of bottles. So this is quite powerful because this means you don't have to give it all the information beforehand. Information can even be wrong or outdated and the system is supposed to notice this. It's supposed to collect negative evidence for information or for knowledge which doesn't work or for some reason. Maybe because the circumstances changed. Maybe because some some other reason. So Patrick, uh, I think we should uh, start to finish your part of the presentation quite soon. Uh -huh. 
uh, I'm almost uh, almost done. Um, and uh, the, maybe the last thing, uh, I also experimented with question answering, but maybe this we can skip. Um, yes, and uh, maybe we can jump to my research course, which is really to to allow the agent to explore its environment via exploration and play and to pick up knowledge when doing so and to allow it to physically manipulate and utilize objects to reach different outcomes like with the bottle we have seen which was a simple case and in all those cases which is really a central aspect of autonomy is this ability to learn from observations and interactions at random and uh, we also wanted to effectively remember places up and objects to essentially build a model of the world. And uh, of course, the key to autonomy is also this ability to, to operate ind independently of humans if necessary. And also, it would be good as a bonus to be able to use information or to extract useful information out of human speech to answer questions and to use language in other ways. That's that's it. Thanks a lot, Patrick. You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as I said, the purpose of the talk then is okay. So Patrick has introduced AGI and the possibilities with, with the AGI from the perspective of NARS. And, and as you saw there, he, he really stressed the integration there of semantic and sensory motor knowledge. So I will continue now with presenting the behavioral pers psychology perspective and research method and what potential research path that that could be. So some of this is described in a longer paper that I published this summer at the NARS uh, workshop at the AGI conference. So I will be speaking from the theoretical perspective of relational frame theory, which is uh, behavioral psychology approach to language and cognition that has been going on since the 80s, basically, with its most updated version in 2016. But why even talk about these things at the same time? Uh, to start with, there are some conceptual similarities. Uh, Patrick's supervisor, Pei Wang, really stresses that, as Patrick said, intelligence as the adaptation with insufficient knowledge and resources and learning from the perspective of relational frame theory is really about learning during the lifetime as ontogenetic adaptation. So these definitions for sure are, are very similar and NARS also stresses the experience grounded semantics uh, that every concept is fluid based on, on experience, which is very similar to how we, we talk about meaning in RFT. So when I say RFT, it's relational frame theory. So some methods we use is typically to conduct something called match to sample experiments. Uh, and for example, studying something called conditional discriminations using match to sample. So very simple, for example, uh, here is a study from 95 where pigeons were trained to discriminate between Monet and Picasso paintings. So they started picking, for example, when they saw the Monet painting, but not when they saw the Picasso. And they, they could generalize it to new Monet and Picasso paintings. Uh, and maybe this is how it could look like on the fur hat robot, for example. Oh, uh, it said that is a person. So, so systems can, can typically 
do this thing uh, with the sensors that Patrick talked about and, and be able to learn how to discriminate using sensory motor knowledge. And in a typical experimental setup, you, if you learn a relationship between A1 and B1, you basically say that the system picks B1 in the context of A1 and picks C1 in the context of A1, or, or you, you can learn, train a system in these relations. So this is how it, for example, could look like in, in NARS using Patrick's system. Uh, that the, after, uh, if the system babbles between the left and right operation, uh, it can over time learn this derived knowledge that in the context of A1, if I, and left is B1, then if I do the left operation, that will lead to some kind of success. So, so you can say in this, if you learn this, we can talk about success or, or G as the, it functions as a reinforcer in that context and, and the sample A1 statements functions as a conditional discrimination. Uh, so uh, generalized identity matching, I will step up <laughs> to make harder and harder experiments. And this is in the match to sample task, uh, someone, a person or a sea lion in this case, uh, learns that if I'm shown A1, I press the same symbol. So here the, the sea lion is shown the palm tree and press the palm tree. But then in a new situation being shown a new symbol, uh, it presses that symbol rather than something it, that it was reinforced on before. So it acts on the uh, abstract knowledge of identity. Uh, uh, this is also something you could talk about in NARS, uh, but it would typically need the layer six uh, abstract uh, variable uh, knowledge relations. But a what really sparked the interest in relation on frame theory was the problems raised from stimulus equivalence. If we take this to human beings, we typically learn relations between A1 and B1 and A1 and C1, but we typically derive a lot of other relations. For example, in this experimental setup again, if you are learned A1, B1, and A1, C1, and A2, B2, and A2, C2, let's say that the uh, sample and, and choices are switched like this, we are presented with C1. Are we supposed to pick B1 or B2 based on the training history? Uh, and, and most people with, with uh, repeated uh, exper experiences pick B1 then. Uh, so this is uh, this is the stimulus sti stimulus equivalence effect, which is something. This is a study from 1986 where they compare this with normally developed children, with uh, those with disabilities, but with language, and those children with without language, and only the children with language could do this phenomenon. So, so it's an argument that this, the stimulus equivalence seems to require language. And, and uh, it seems to develop around two years of age, uh, and, and, and it hasn't been reliably demonstrated in any non-human animal. And it seems to be a case where sensory motor knowledge and semantic knowledge needs to be integrated. Um, a harder problem would be transfer of stimulus function. So this is a study from 1987. People were taught uh, a set of equivalence relations. And then the subjects were trained to either wave or, or clap in the presence of B1 or B2, respectively. So that's B1 acted as a discriminator. Um, so the question then, would the discriminating functions transfer to C1 and C2, which, is, which it did? And in the same study, three other subjects 
we're trained to sort a set of cards using feedback correct and no, but shown cards B1 or B2 at the same time. Uh, and would then the reinforcing function of just showing a card, but a card from the same equivalence class, would the function of the reinforcer transfer to, the, to those untrained symbols? And it becomes even harder when you introduce other relations that, than uh, sameness, like opposition, because if something is opposite to something and that is opposite to something else, then A and C are, are the same. And this is a classic study from 1991 uh, where this was tested. You were basically shown a, a symbol, same symbol, and uh, was trained to select B1 in the context of A1 uh, and in the context of being shown the opposite symbol and A1, you were reinforced for selecting B2. Um, so the network trained was like this and you tested, they tested for derived relations. And this is something you could do with a semantic knowledge in NARS. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a real fundamental thesis of, of the relational frame theory uh, that the, the relating act is a, an operant, meaning it's, a, it's an action, <laughs> the integrated action of picking and thinking at the same time, basically. So it, it, this is really, a case where sensory motor knowledge and semantic knowledge needs to be integrated. That means to make a robot do this is hard. And transformation of stimulus function, not only transfer, transformation. Uh, for example, if we learn like these coins that we never heard of, A1, A is worth more than B and B is worth more than C, we derive a lot of information on value even if it's totally contextual, we don't, you can't base the value on, on how the coins look or what size or so on. So, so uh, these patterns are really contextual in nature. So this is just very, very briefly, this is how you typically study this in these experiments that you train a network of more and less relations and study if something is derived to be even more reinforcing. Uh, and this is another very cool study where people were trained a more less than relationship network and had an electric shock <laughs> to one of the symbols uh, and they measured skin conductance and people actually had higher intensity of skin conductance to a symbol that they had never seen before uh, because they derived that uh, it, would, they, it would get them a, an even larger shock, so to speak. So that's a real case of transformation of stimulus function. This is Tony Lofthouse who is on the call uh, here. He has studied the transformation of stimulus function uh, using, so this is, Coffee and juice are opposites, and coffee is good. Coffee is bad, and juice is good. But uh, uh, is beer even better? So, so Tony has, how to say, shown how this can be done using the semantic inference part of Mars. Uh, and uh, importantly. This is like what was studied in RFT 20, 15 years ago. So, so a lot of stuff has happened in that field. Uh, this is just one example of a paper from 2017 that I think really takes RFT to the next level. So I'm just arguing that this is not the end of RFT. It's a large roadmap, so to speak. Okay, but we were here to talk about machine psychology. What is that? So RFT is a theory that is based in contextual behavioral science. 
So, so that is something emerging from behavioral science that emphasizes context and the centrality of situated action uh, and emphasizes predicting and influencing psychological events with precision, scope and depth. So if we are gonna talk about something like machine psychology, the question is, can behavioral psychology then provide some kind of hints? What would that be? Uh, maybe it's based on this premise, learning as adaptation compared to, for example, learning as pure information processing. Maybe this can be predicting and influencing machine psychological events with context, in context with precision, scope and depth. And highly likely emphasizes the centrality of long language processes. And I think this opens up for many exciting research programs in something I would call uh, the digital futures area. Um, for example, I think you only need to open a, an RFT based book, for example, on how to train people with autism and de developmental disabilities. And then you have lots of research programs. So for example, teaching a system, reading and spelling, teaching syntax, uh, functional communication at the bottom, training analogies. Uh, training perspective taking, uh, establishing empathy, mathematical reasoning, uh, self-directed rules, and flexible, intelligent, intelligent and creative behavior. So the self and the perspective taking is really something that is emphasized in these models. And of course, also connecting it to clinical psychology. And I think this is nice that since Mars also emphasizes this, it has a self model and an emotion model. This is a paper that Patrick wrote with his supervisor. So RFT has accounts of empathy, for example. And my own research field is uh, in clinical psychology is very much about uh, understanding depression, which has grown to become a very large problem. So for example, let's say that we wanted to have a, a robot that was depressed <laughs> that we could uh, treat with human dialogue. Uh, this is a demo we did uh, with Furhat as a dialogue system acting as a depressed patient. But can we extend like a dialogue system with something of a, how to say it, three layer approach of uh, non-axiomatic logic and RFT that provides a foundation how you can look at depression in a machine so based on RFT models of depression where typically the, cell, the self is emphasized being in a relation with I'm a horrible person which can be strengthened from experience of statements like I'm divorced, fired, no kids, I drink too much. So I think, yeah, I think you understand what, where I'm going with this. So it seems like it is a real centrality to emph emphasize both these aspects uh, of, of reasoning. If these massive problems uh, are going to be solved. So in summary, we, we with this talk, we hope to illuminate some problems that might be hard to solve using standard machine learning and deep learning. And I think OpenRS for application has a very, very interesting model to solve this integration of sensory motor and semantic knowledge. And behavioral psychology seems to provide an interesting path for how to make scientific progress in AGI. Uh, for example, studying it in uh, match to sample experiments. Uh, so I think RFT, relational frame theory, opens up for a theoretical account of many of these hard problems that we could then study in intelligent systems. So thank you very much. Um,